Okay, everybody, thank you for viewing this. This is going to be a highlight of the webinar that we did on Wednesday, the 18th of January. We had a nice attendance. This is my story. I have been a strength coach for over 25 years. I've owned two centers and ran a third center. I've been coaching either on food or exercise for over 25 years, food specifically for the last eight years. I'm certified in precision nutrition as well as primal health certification and, and have written over a million words of food journal comments. And when I first started doing this, I did it pretty much how the industry does it. Now, the industry basically has you fill out a food journal and they go through the food journal at, after a week of you filling out the food journal, everything that you ate or drank, then the food coach or the nutritionist will review it and come back to you with comments. Well, I wrote over a million words of food journal comments and I kept seeing the same problem. The problem was that by the time I got back to the client with the comments, they weren't very relevant anymore. So it's not dissimilar to someone coaching a pro basketball team and saying, hey guys, I'm gonna walk off the court, I'll be back in 15 minutes, let's see how you're doing. And so what I wanna start with is talking a little bit more of what led me to here and the problems that I've seen in the food coaching and nutrition space in terms of getting people to be successful. Most people fail. They measure success in weight loss as losing the weight that you wanna lose and then keeping it off for one year or longer. So the success rate is below 20% and depending on how you count it, I've seen as low as 6%. So that means out of the $76 billion that's spent every year on food, only six to 10% of that probably on average is actually a success. So it's a problem. So I wanna talk about why the problems exist and what those are, and then how am I addressing them with my clients as a coach? And then we'll talk about what I've developed to help address that through an app called Planable, which is a marketplace of coaches where Planable curates the coaches and then matches those coaches to a team of clients. Okay, I'm looking at my notes, so just get, bear with me so we can get through this. The biggest problem, as I see initially, outside of the fact that tracking food on a food journal doesn't work, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on that, is just the mixed messaging. You have fad diets, you have people say, I went keto and I lost this weight, I became a vegan, I lost this weight, I became a vegetarian, and it was successful for me. The problem is it's an experiment of one. Everybody is different. So keto may work, for So what are the primary problems? The primary problems are the messages are very conflicting. There are these fad diets that come out. Most recently, it's not necessarily a fad diet because, but if you looked at it, I think it's like a, I've seen something like a seven year cycle. We had Atkins way back in the eighties, and then you had the Mediterranean diet, and then you had low fat, high carbs. You have people saying vegan is the way to go. The problem is that everybody is completely different. So if you're lucky and you find the diet that works for you, you'll be successful. And a lot of people have gone on and with huge amounts of frustration. I recently coached a woman, 72 years old, and she has tried everything up and down, yo-yo dieting all the time. She loses weight and it's been very frustrating for her. And we lost 30 pounds at 72 years old. And the main reason that I think we did, and we did it successfully, is the thing that I talked about earlier, is the problem with accountability and using the food journal method. I'm, we're gonna talk a little bit about calories, and then I'm gonna come back to the food journal. Okay, the problem with calorie counting is that most people don't understand that typically the average person underestimates the number of calories that they're ingesting by as much as 50% is what the research shows and they overestimate the amount of calories expended by a dramatic number as well, not quite as high. Even if you look at the labeling, the FDA requirements on labeling, because uh, probably 20, 30 years ago, food companies were forced to put ingredient lists and calories on the labels. The, they, the food companies have up to 20% leeway and they can still, it's considered an accurate representation. And typically on average, the food that you see on the label has about four or 5% more calories 
than what's shown. So if it showed 100, 100 calories, then it may be 105 to 110, okay? The other problem is, I don't know if you understand how a calorie is counted. You may have heard that calories are a measurement of heat. They use what they call a bomb calorimeter, which is a hot pot with an internal pot, and then the external has water. They throw a piece of food in it, and then they start at room temperature, and they, every time they turn up the degrees on the water, they keep turning it up, turning it up until the food finally burns, and that's the total number of calories for each degree that they have to increase it. That's why it's considered a measurement of heat. So they're waiting to see at what point does the, ca does the food actually burn. So what you're looking at is we have problems with data in and data out. So the idea of having accountability becomes more and more difficult even if you do religiously keep a food journal because the data may be inaccurate. So we're gonna talk about how to overcome that. Okay, the science is complicated. Even if you can count the calories accurately, digestion and calories, because people will argue and say, oh, calorie's not a calorie. A calorie is a calorie, but the problem is some of the calories you may not digest as well. So for example, nuts, if you eat your steak more rare than cooked, then you'll absorb less of the calories. The digestion of fiber, all of these things impact the total amount of calories that are absorbed into your body versus the total number of calories that you eat. So you may eat 100 calories in a particular meal and you may only absorb 85 of that 100 because of the way the meal's prepared or the type of food that it is. So that is also an issue that becomes problematic when you're journaling food because you're looking at it and saying, okay, I ate this amount of food. What did I really absorb? Okay, so some foods are less digestible than others. Sleep, gut health, and size all come into play. Sleep is a huge one. I know when I travel, if I'm jet lagged, then I have a tendency to eat more because I'm trying to find energy because of the poor sleep that I usually get when you're traveling. I'm trying to make up for that energy with food. So you'll see that next. The other thing that one thing that I can tell you is the most digestible food and the one that you absorb the most calories from is going to be processed foods. Highly processed foods takes a lot of the digestion out. So you absorb the majority of those calories. So the first thing we do and I do when I'm coaching a particular client and coaches do typically is to try to minimize the amount of processed foods. Are you gonna be a calorie counter or are you gonna be looking at your macros? Those are the two primary ways that people look at it. And I'll talk about how to address that when we get to the tactics, okay? People come to me all the time. They say, Jacques, I wanna eliminate all my carbs. And the first question I ask is, you have to put it in context. They'll ask me, is that a good strategy? And I'll, and I'll go, is it sustainable? Do you think you can sustain it? Someone will say, well, I wanna to to, I want to lose weight before an event. So I'm gonna to go to 500 calories a day. Very unsustainable for most people. These types of approaches need to be taken into context. So typically what I ask the client is, can you sustain this? And if you could, how difficult would it be to do? The other problem that you have with weight loss is the irony of exercise and eating less. Because most people say it's calories in, calories out. So if I just eat less and exercise more, I'll burn through a greater number of calories and have a deficit, and I'll be able to function accordingly and lose the weight. The problem with that is as you exercise more, you get more efficient at exercise. Our bodies are conservation mechanisms, so they're always trying to do everything with less energy. So if you go out and you run a mile and you do that every day, after about two, three weeks of running, your body is burning less calories for that same mile. So you either have to change the pace of the mile or you have to increase the mile from a mile to a mile and a half because your body's gotten very comfortable at utilizing a certain level of calories and it's going to get better and use less energy and less energy. So as you train more, your efficiency improves. Now the opposite side of the coin is if you try to say, I'm gonna to go to a 500 calorie a day diet, the body will lower energy output because there's not enough fuel to match the energy input. So what does it do? It makes you tired. It makes you lethargic. It makes your exercise output lower. So when you go to the gym, if you do, you won't have the same pace that you did on the treadmill or on whatever exercise you choose. So that's one of the ironies and the difficulty in, and the, one of the primary problems in doing this because people underestimate the calories that they're burning 
because they don't realize they become more efficient at burning calories. The next thing is what they call NEAT, which is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And what that is, that's just fidgeting. That's just me getting up, walking outside, pacing if you're a pacer in your office, are you sitting at your desk all day long? And fidgeters, people that are have a harder time sitting still, I'm one of those people, will burn anywhere from 500 to 1,000 calories more a day because it's a constant movement that takes place as opposed to just an hour on a treadmill or 30 minutes on a treadmill or something like that. Your brain burns the most calories. Approximately 25% of the calories burned during the day are burned by your brain. So your brain is on all the time. Even when you're asleep, it's working to keep you alive. So that's the primary source of calories are used for the brain. And then the last thing that we have a problem with is what they call fat set point. Fat set point is if you weigh 200 pounds right now, and if I have an athlete that wants to gain weight, and put on muscle for, because he's a football, high school football player, and he's been at 200 pounds for the next, last year or so, I can probably raise that bar to 220, maybe 225, 10% plus or minus. And on the downside, if he was a wrestler and he says, I wanna drop a weight class or two and go down to 180 pounds, it becomes difficult when you get below 10%. That's what they call fat set point. I saw a TED talk one time where they said, basically you're in a difficult situation. There's nothing you can do about fat set point. And what I do is I look at body comp. Most people just say, I wanna look better and I wanna be healthier. And if that's what your goal is, clothes fit looser, your arms look better, you don't look heavy, and you're healthy, then what you're doing is you can do, you can still maintain the same weight and just change the body composition so that you're carrying more muscle versus percentage of body fat. So that's the way to overcome fat set point. Okay, so let's talk about, those are most of the problem. So that, we, that I've seen, that these are the primary problems that you're going to see. So what I take is a very sensible approach, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. And there's two primary areas of that. One is developing a solid strategy, and number two are the tactics necessary for day-to-day -day management of the strategy. So the debate, is, there's a big debate. If you look at the internet, you know, the vegans and the carnivores, if you put them in a room, would hate each other. The omnivores, the Mediterranean diet, should I be keto, should I be vegetarian, should I be pescatarian? Everybody is very proud of the way they eat. And it's funny, I heard a podcast the other day saying, why are so people, why are people so aggressive about defending their particular diet? Because they want to feel right. With exercise, you can pick a lot of different methods for exercise, so people don't fight over it. People will fight over it in terms of how to do it and the technique of exercise, but not near as much as they do with food, which is the best course of action. I tell clients I can take any one of those diets, vegan, keto, carnivore, pescatarian, vegetarian, and I can get a client to lose weight. You know why? Because of accountability. So the coaching side of it, I keep coming back to that because my original metaphor of a coach in a basketball game walking off the court holds very true. You have to create a structure of accountability to be successful at changing your body composition. And if you don't have that built in, then you will probably fail. That's why you need to have accountability. So the only way when I say I can do it with any one of those, as long as they are healthy, that's the one caveat. For example, if you're a vegan, Doritos are a vegan food. So they're not very, but they qualify as a vegan food. So a lot of people will skirt the way around their particular diet and still eat poorly. So I tell people, eat real food. If you can eat, people will sometimes ask me, Jacques, what's the diet you use? And I go, it's a no label diet. I basically don't have labels on the food that I eat. And I'm what I call a 95 guy. 90% of the time, 95% of the time I eat really super well. It's going to be 100% grass-fed protein sources, wild-caught fish. It's going to be organic vegetables and organic fruits. No labels on all of these. This is how I eat. 5% of the time, if I'm going to go a football game with my buddy and we're going to have pizza, I don't mind. Most people I see that are successful are somewhere around 80% and above, and then somewhere between 20% to less that they're going off the wagon. Okay. So the first thing in establishing any strategy, remember we're gonna look at strategy and tactics, is establish a starting point, be honest about it. Where are you starting from? 
what is truly my exercise amount? People will say, okay, do you exercise? Yeah, go three times a week to the gym. Do you really go three times a week to the gym? And when you go, are you really working out or is it a social aspect? So be honest with yourself about where the starting point is. I, when I in, in have an evaluation with a client and I'm asking them, how do you eat? They always say, I eat really healthy. And then when we start getting granular with it, we find that healthy and goal settings may be two complete different things. So someone say, I eat really healthy or for the most part healthy, but it may not be healthy and it may not fit the goal that they want. So someone says, I wanna lose weight. I wanna get, I wanna look like this. That healthy diet may not be appropriate for the goal that they want. Okay, so you have to have an honest starting point. So be honest with yourself because this is like any strategy. You have to know where you're starting from. What I wanna do now is run down the primary issues of developing a strategy and what I think are the components of being successful. So I'm just gonna bang through a number of these and then come back and spend a couple of moments on each one uh, that, uh, that I think are the most important ones. Mindset is number one. You have to go in with the right mindset. And this is really a difference between motivation and commitment. You have to recognize, and I tell this to a lot of clients and a lot of coaches, that uh, when it comes to food, many of us are eight-year-olds. And we have to have recognize that there is an eight-year-old that wants to go out in the middle of the street and play with their soccer ball when there's traffic, wants to run through the red light as opposed to waiting for the light. So you have to look at yourself as the eight-year-old on this side sometimes, and then who's the adult in the room that's going to say no. Comfort foods and dopamine. Comfort foods give you a dopamine rush, and so many people keep reaching for those because they want to keep reigniting that dopamine push. In order to be successful, a strategy has to have a time horizon. It has to be that your life dictates the strategy, not the strategy dictating your life because it won't work otherwise. So it has to, if you're a person that is on a plane all the time, then it has to revolve around that travel schedule. One of the big things I think is that you have to understand that health is urgent, not just necessary when you make that decision and you say that my health is urgent. And typically you'll see it when you have a close family member or someone in your close social circle get sick. And then you'll see that there is an urgency with improving it. But typically what we do is we walk away and we go, that's not going to happen. It has to be looked at as an investment, not a cost. So you have to say, I'm going to pay for a coach or I'm going to pay for a gym membership. And I tell clients, the higher the price, the more likely you are to stay with it. So make the investment. You Remember, you're an experiment of one. You have to make small changes. So that's why the honest starting point is important so that you're not doing a 180 degree turn and trying to institute all of these changes at once, it will not work. The strategy must be adaptable. So it has to change to changes in your life because your life is going to get in the way. I guarantee you that. Age is a component of the strategy, but it should not be an obstacle. It should just be something that you have to take into account. Your history, of it needs to be simple. And once again, the end point has to be there. You have to have an end point. Typically with my clients, I do a three month end point where I say, okay, we're gonna start and we're gonna look at this and we wanna wrap our heads around three months. And then I break the three months into months and then I break each month into a week and then I break each week into a day and then I go through meal to meal and I try to knock off one of those. So when I start with a client, I may say, okay, do you think we can make the change in breakfast? And they go, yeah, I think I can do breakfast. Okay, so we'll just start with breakfast. And then we go a couple of days with breakfast. They go, I'm feeling great. This is great. And then I go to lunch. And now someone may say, I think I can make these changes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay, great. So let's see if we can sustain that and that the change is too great. I have a tendency as a coach to make the change lesser than the client wants to. The client wants results fast. I want sustainability. So I typically bring them into the deep end slower. Eating is social. Food is an expression of love and for a lot of people. So you have to recognize that is something that has to be taken into account because I've done long fasts and probably one of the biggest problems with fast in the real long term is not so much that you get hungry and I'll talk about hormones and why that doesn't happen. It's more the social aspect of food. I can't go out. And if you sure don't want to go to dinner where everyone's eating around you and you're fasting and you're four days into a fast, it's not a lot of fun. So those are the things that you want to think about in developing an overall strategy. What I think are the most important ones are mindset. You have to have a mindset that says, I am going to burn the ships at the shore and I'm going to move forward from here. I'm going to be not just motivated, 
but committed. If you're listening to this now, you're motivated, but are you truly committed to doing the planning? I tell people commitment planning. That means you have to say, I'm not going to have these things in my house. I'm going to change what's in my pantry. I'm going to change what I have in my fridge so I can't easily reach for these things that I may have. Okay, so that's the overall strategy mindset. Remember the eight year comfort foods and then try to give yourself some leeway so that you pick that percentage that you want to be, whether it's 80, 20, 90, 10, and then slowly improve it. And then as time goes on, you'll conquer this. Okay, the next step, so we've talked about the basic aspects of strategy. Now we wanna talk about tactics. Most people go to tactics first. I'm just gonna cut out all my carbs, that's a tactic. The strategy is, is that sustainable for me in the long run? Can I do that? And if I'm gonna do that, how am I going to do that and make it successful? So it's a mistake. The other problem with just going with tactics without having the overarching strategy is your life will get in the way and you haven't accommodated for that. So I'm trying to get the clients to gain some wins. I want wins, whether it's through exercise and they start doing that and that's a win, whether it's through diet and changes, like I said, can we conquer breakfast first? There's my first win. Can I conquer breakfast and lunch? There's a win. And you wanna celebrate those wins. The other thing is I don't like hard no's. Hard no's are difficult because they usually lead to disordered eating, problems, binge eating, all of these kinds of things. I like guardrails. So I develop a guardrail that says, okay, we're only going to have this, or I want you to go to this function full. So you eat before you go, that develops a guardrail. Then it's not a hard no when you get there, okay? So the better approach when you're looking at this is try to develop guardrails that manage change in your diet, okay? So now let's talk about the characteristics of technical success. Number one, simplicity. Number two, remember that your mindset has to be in place. Don't forget that. An honest assessment of your strengths and weaknesses. What do you do? What do you do poorly? I have a sweet tooth personally. So the way I manage that sweet tooth is with 70% or above dark chocolate, which is healthy for you and has very little sugar. I have a little quarter of a bar every night with a handful of Brazil nuts. It gives me a lot of selenium. And that's my dessert that kills my sweet tooth. Make sure you have an endpoint. I've the in the three month time horizon that I gave, the first month is the most important tactically. This is when you I try to make changes in habits is over that first four weeks. The second month is trying to cement those habits into a life and into your lifestyle. Number three is getting a rhythm to maintain those. And once we get past, then we can determine, okay, what's the next step? You need to have that endpoint in place or you will fail. It needs to have sustainability in mind. So tactically, you have to have that in. Real foods is a tactic that's very easy. If you just eat slower and dine instead of swallowing your food whole, your weight loss will improve dramatically. Keep track of eating real food and eating slower. And the accountability has to be built in. Whether you have a team, so you get a significant other or you get a couple of friends to say, hey, listen, we're going to do this journey together. And it's a fantastic way to do it. And then you need to have somehow build in an accountability method, plannable, and the app that I developed does that for them. And here's what I think is one of the primary differences in how we account is we want to get fast feedback to the client. And the way we do that is through photos. So a client sends me a photo and I come back with comments, add more protein. Can you add more of the vegetables? Can you do this? Can we substitute this for that? The other thing that I do tactically is I have the client write down their favorite protein, carbs, and fats. So that way I can pick from those and say, can you pick this instead? And I already know that they like it. Write down where your weaknesses are and embrace those as an opportunity to figure out how to solve them, not as something that you're beating yourself up over all the time. Plan your meals, and not in the sense of that you have to lay every meal out, but plan the basic protein, carbohydrates, and fat, having no labels, eating real food, minimizing the processed foods, all of these things. Eat your favorite foods. What I have clients do is write down their favorite foods, give them to me, and then I'll choose from that list so that I always know that I'm just not trying to throw something in that they don't like. The closer you are to the farmer, the better. So the source. So if you can go to farmer's markets, that's the better choice. Teams work better than being on your own, but some people work well, and you can always hire a coach so you're not out there by yourself. 
add up the small wins for a victory. I believe in smaller doses for long-term success. The other tactic that I use is I try to add food as eliminating or subtracting food. So I'll say, can you eat another chicken breast or half a chicken breast? So someone's having one chicken breast, I'm trying to bump the protein. The science supports most people under eat protein. I'm trying to bump protein immediately with most people. It also crowds out and makes people feel. I can eat rows and rows of nut or butter cookies and dip them into milk or coffee and I could blow through a whole box of those. But if you gave me a roasted chicken, I would be full. I couldn't even eat the whole thing. Why? Because of the protein and the fat in the chicken. So tactically eat the protein source first and then go to your fibrous foods first and then go to the starchy foods last and any types of things so you're always full. We're trying to create an environment of fullness that allows you not to overeat. So the idea of thermogenesis, calories in, calories out, is intact. But what we're trying to do is find something with foods that you like that work in this way. So keep that in mind. Believe that it's doable. If you can afford to hire a coach, I would do it. And then celebrate the wins. Recognize that set by, setbacks will happen. You're going to have them. But that's okay. Everyone's going to have setbacks. If you have a coach, as a coach, what I do is I look at those and I go, okay, so how can we create an environment that's going to minimize these setbacks? Oftentimes the setback will come because I have to cook for someone else. Someone will tell me, well, I have to cook for everyone else. That's fine. Separate your meal, eat something beforehand, add some food on the front end so you don't have to eat as much of this so we figure out ways around it. Okay? So accountability is your superpower. That's what I tell people. If you can develop an accountability structure and you eat real food and you use some of those tactics, you should be in pretty good shape. Don't let the eight-year-old run the show. Say no. One of the things that's a good exercise, if you have the time and the inclination to do it, if you really want to see what you're e eating, be honest and fill out a food journal like My Fitness Pal is the one that I use. You can get that online. It's free for a week and you'll really see, holy smokes, I eat a lot more than I thought I did. Monitor the changes in your habits. Food matters, but it's more about the accountability of the food if you're trying to make change in weight loss. It's the type of food is going to matter more about your overall health. So I try to move both those needles with clients. The last thing is I talked a little bit about Planable. You can go to planable.com. This is what I have created to address these problems. As I said that I, when I first started doing this, I would use a food journal. And I just saw how poor that was. And I saw that the people that I had the best success with were the people who were coming into my gym and I was seeing them regularly and I was asking them, how are you doing? What did you eat? And I would come back to them with instantaneous changes in feedback. The problem with food journaling and the traditional people on food, it's hard to get the data to get it accurately and regularly come up. Use, we use photos with the coaches on Planable. All of the coaches are certified. We'll match your team with a coach. If you're an individual, you can either pick a coach, but we try to lean clients towards finding a team. I tell people, assemble your team, hire a coach, and win this uh, weight loss issue. Please visit our website at www.planibble.com to sign up for a trial.